Mauro Ranallo, how are you? Speaking of talking too fast, hello everyone. <laughs> now, Mauro, you're some kind of broadcaster, is that? Um, <laughs> I, I've been known to say a few words over the years, maybe more than most people would have liked to have heard. But one of the first times I became aware of you was a uh, Mirko Krokop uh, video. Where what? Did, what exactly did they do? Where he he kind of punked you? Yeah, he did punk me. Uh, that was set up by the illustrious, legendary El Wapo Boss Rutin, who you may know as Rooker from. Uh, the CBS sitcom Kevin Can Wait that should have been renewed for a third season so my man could get paid, but that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, he's a, a, a fighter of, of you know, no, to one of the baddest men on the planet. And uh, when I started working in Japan, he helped get me the gig. And Mirko Krokop, even now, even though he's out of Bellator 200, which I'm doing on Friday, was looking forward to his Bellator debut. Uh, known for being a very stoic, silent killer type, and it was my first time meeting him, and I let Boss know that I'm nervous of the guy. I will interview him, but I'd rather you do it so I can get my feet wet. And he's like, no, no problem. So he ends up interviewing his opponent, the guy that I was supposed to interview, and I go and interview uh, Mirko, and you see on the video what transpired. And that was my uh, third show with the uh, the company. I thought, okay, well, this this chapter in my life is over, and perhaps my life is over because when you see him walk towards me at the end, I'm thinking uh, Kaiser Sose and Usual Suspects, and where he's walking over me, and then boom, big head kick right to my <laughs> face. Uh, instead, he goes, it's a joke. So it, it's lived on for 14 years, believe it or not. Yeah, I still you did get look a lot of really, feedback. really frightened. No, you I was. legitimately frightened. Yeah. yeah. Like you didn't I, see it coming. No, and uh, there was a beeline to the hotel room to, you know, I, I'm glad I was wearing dark pants. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> a change needed to happen. Um, when, you're, when you're doing all this stuff, because the documentary uh, that is coming out on Showtime uh, on Friday at 9 p.m. Bipolar Rock and Roller. Which is, it's, a, it's amazing... Like I kind of knew your story, but mm -hmm. the the level to which you revealed in this thing is like off the charts. Like it's as revealing as anybody, especially in your position, mm -hmm. right? Because you're in this position of you you're suffering from bipolar, but at the same time, you're as successful in broadcasting as you've ever been. Yes, you could easily use this moment to kind of push that aside a little bit, let the good times roll, mm -hmm. and like, let me be there for my spots, and if I'm going crazy over here in a hotel room, don't <laughs> worry about it. Don't look at me. Sure. Like, I'll see you at the next show, but instead, like, you kind of let us all see, not, you know, it's not just a description of, like, what mania looks like, mm -hmm. what a manic episode looks like, like, what, what, if I'm this high right now, what do the lows look like? Like, you see and that was These the lows. entire you point. See Sam. the emotion. Yes, you see, you, like you're just pouring. Yep, and out. it's and and Jim, uh, you know, not to you're I'm a successful comedian. You you're a successful broadcaster. What I'm saying, I believe the most successful people in this industry are touched by something. Like Robin Williams said, "Touched by man is touched by fire." For me, it has been a constant struggle of trying to just. Uh, for me, work is therapy. And because of what you see, uh, back up, the, the documentary had to be as revealing, as raw, as uncomfortable to watch, or else there would be no point to it. Hey, I, yeah, we all have a unique journey. We all had a dream as kids. Uh, our, you know, Some of our dreams came true, but the point of this doc was we write about it, we talk about it sometimes, but no one, like you say, has made it uh, as clear as we try to do in this doc what mental illness looks like and it's the invisible illness we're not in a wheelchair i'm not on crutches uh you know people have this it's all about the stigma snap out of it you're you're oh you're yeah. just lazy or oh you're just looking for attention well here you go this is this is what it looks like am i looking for attention or am i am i suffering human being at times it, right and that's where i'm i want to just make it okay to not be okay it's not just looking for attention because there's times where like you know i deal with my own nonsense sure. we all do but when you're dealing with it alone, hmm. like you're by yourself, right? And you're thinking like life is good. I got to jump off the balcony. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's crazy and, thinking. And Jim, alone in a crowd, I can be, and this is it. Like this, Linus had his blanket, these head, these headphones, this microphone. Even though it's an antithetical to what most people would say, because public speaking after death, the thing people are afraid of, or or being on camera, this is my security blanket. And so for me, even the moment I take it off. And, and, you know, people milling about backstage or, or people coming up, hey, man, big fan. I'm immediately, oh, my God, oh, my God. And, and 
there's this sense of jubilation because, wow, you get to call the biggest fights. And you know, look at TakeOver New Orleans, man. One of the yeah. greatest events ever. Yeah. I should have been riding that high forever. Instead, not even moments later, I'm like, oh, God, I'm a fraud. Oh, shit, they're going to they're gonna fire me. or See, all me throw people. me, yeah. yeah. It's unbelievable. And Which is especially, that's why. It's especially unbelievable because you go over like all the all the shots that you've gotten and the fact that even like you talk about TakeOver in WWE. The last year has been ridiculous, my man. Klitschko and Josh won yeah. for the 90,000 of Wembley. Mayweather, McGregor. Yeah. Second yes. biggest pay per view ever. I, AJ Styles, John Cena, 2017 I mean, match of the year. They all be, so without the condition, without the illness, the career <laughs> from literally growing up on a dead end road in a farm in, in you know BF nowhere to to doing all of this, it it's bipolar in its own sense. Mm-hmm. And even now, I, I sense. Look at me getting more excited, more <laughs> rapid, more. I. It just happens, isn't it? A, it's like, a, and I've, I've described it before. I don't know how to say. It. It's like a chemical dump. Yes, like it, yes. it, it starts at the top <laughs> yes. of your head, and you feel it like wash into your upper chest, and it's a, it can be comforting or it can be very painful. Very well said, Jim. But it's something that is you can't describe what it is. But whether it's a sexual rush or yep. it's a rush of depression, and then all of a sudden it becomes elation. Like it's just, it, it, it's almost like it, it's just it's it's a warmth. It's menthol. Do I, you I, have a camera in my? Did you? surreptitiously put a camera in my life and been watching because you're describing it to a T. Well, if you have a toilet, I'd put a camera there. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, you, you, well, how well said is that? And you just said it's hard to describe. And for us who talk for a living and mm-hmm. do it quite well, I would imagine, that's why it had to be visceral. It had to be visual. I remember uh, Ron Howard, A Beautiful Mind, Russell Crowe, and how he depicted schizophrenia. And I thought for the first time in my life, dealing with what I'm dealing, man, this guy, he, he gets the... The poetic, the creative nature of all this, because let's face it, and they're bipolar in definition. The I don't think I'd be here sitting with you guys if I wasn't the manic part of it. I believe that that has really proved to be the jet fuel that has let me reach all of these heights of success. So, what, oh, sorry. There, no, sorry. There is there is a positive to the negative. That's what I was about. I was literally just about to ask. When when do you look at yourself and go, I'm I'm kind of glad I'm this way because it fuels me creatively, or do you ever go like, I just wish I was like? Do you ever look at people who are in a happy relationship and are just content? Like, oh, we had a great time. We watched a movie, went to bed, and you're like, I wish I was that person. Like, I would love to know what that's like to be that person. Great question. Absolutely not, because most relationships I've been subjected to are just not happy, even though they say they are. And that's the other people always ask, well, how, how do you deal with personal relationships? Uh, last time I had a serious relationship was 15 years ago. Again, a uh, Jenny Neidhart, Natty's sister, yeah. Jim Neidhart's uh, daughter. She's in the movie. The, the, yeah, she, yeah. And, and that the, I've always been drawn to people who either get me totally or just want to ride the wave of, of mania. And, and as you see, even in the doc, but we used to have get togethers at my friend's place. I was a nightclub DJ as well. And it's, you know, we go four hours of spinning and then we go until five, six in the morning at, at their place, just improvising, doing our own version of SNL or whatever. But looking back now, sure. If for a first glance, that's entertaining, but holy shit, there's some, <laughs> what's up with, and I wasn't on anything. I wasn't on cocaine. Or I was drinking. The only self-medication I did before really trying to find right treatment was I was drunk 42 days in a row and it wasn't a, a good thing, but, and as has been broached, uh, the only thing I have found to, to keep me, you know, hanging on, as Kim Wilde would say, uh, cannabis. And I don't know if it's the, what it is in THC that, that with my chemicals or my makeup, and this is what's so frustrating, guys, as much as uh, I'm trying to, to bang the drama, we have Mariah Carey and Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan, Logic, and all of these actors, Jim Norton is doing his thing here today as well. We, we need to, to raise voices, but we still don't know what it is. Is it a chemical imbalance? Is it hereditary? Is it a, a product of our environment? I know that it's multi-generational on my mom's side, especially when it comes to depression. But in terms of treatment, we need more money, not less. Look what's happening to our military veterans. The amount of feedback, you guys, just based on the trailer that I've received, predominantly by men, and how open they are in sharing with me their fears, their struggles. I had an 18-year-old girl from Germany text me this morning, or text me, email me this morning, literally saying, and and it, you know, I can break down or whatever, saying that just seeing the trailer has inspired her to get help. She was going to kill herself. So for me, it's not about being messianic or the, I'm Jesus. I want to help save lives that are being 
they're dying unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. Well, how does it make you feel? Like that? That's an amazing impact because you do sports for a living. You sure. do this great announcing, and then you reveal something personal, and you actually realize that people are like changed by it. This is the. This is why I'm on this earth, honestly, Jim. I've always wanted to perform. I wanted, buddy. You have no idea how much respect I have for stand-up comedians because to me, that's always been something. Wow, I'd love to just try and see. And then the 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 crippling, debilitating fear of bombing is the. You know, it's just so. For me, it's this, I want to be an advocate. I want, I've always looked out for the little guy. I can remember being eight, nine years old at school. We'd have hot dog days and 75 cents. You get your little chocolate milk and your hot dog. And there was a boy there but twice in a row. He, he didn't participate. And this is in the seventies. And I'm like, I, I went and robbed change out of my dad's pockets. So this kid could have part of hot dog day. And I'm not, oh, what a great guy. But that's who I am. That's how I'm wired. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Robin Hood, baby. Uh, but seriously, it's, I've always loved the underdog. We all do, but I, and I know that in many ways I am. So I wanted to show people, look what I'm doing. It's a constant struggle, but talking about it, like you guys are allowing me to do and having just your support network, Sam. Jim, you're now my support network. I have so many people who are are wanting good things for me. I want others to feel that because people are suffering in silence and it's costing them their lives. When you go and you showed, it, it kind of surprised me in the documentary that you you talk about the cannabis and how yes. that's what I, I'm you surprised you they allowed it. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, whether it's because more and more nowadays I hear from individuals who have various different ailments that cannabis mm. is what helps them, but... I don't hear that from organizations. Have sure. you had any blowback, whether it's from Showtime or WWE or Bellator or any of these, any any organization? It warms the cockles of my heart that I have had nothing but unmitigated support, and I know why. Uh, it starts with Steven Espinosa and Showtime because uh, uh, Harris Usanovich, my best friend, who was the guy I let in and let, you know, film all of this wouldn't happen without him by the way he deserves he he spent his own money uh was away from his young family for days this was a labor of love for him because he firmly believed in the message that we were going to try to get across but wwe uh bellator but like i say steven espinoza at first said man you know we got to protect him like this is our guy he's our voice of showtime boxing and as soon as he said it he said to himself well this is that's the problem right there yeah we have to show so and yes, we are, uh, from what I hear, billions of dollars a year lost to mental health issues, uh, people, you know, not being able to work. And yet, if you have the flu, if you're undergoing chemotherapy treatment, uh, undergoing dialysis, with all due respect, to, and I, I've lost people to, to every known illness known, how can you not then allow people who are unable to get out of bed because they're looking at the light fixture, wondering if it can hold their weight? We, we, without mental health, there is no health. I wish people, it's, it's all just about the stigma, stigma of mental health, stigma of cannabis, stigma of sports entertainment, professional wrestling, call it what sure. you will. It's, I just want to get the conversation started. I don't care how vulnerable I am made to feel. If it can save one life and judging by the feedback already, it's doing that. How the hell can anyone give me backlash? Are you sexually compulsive or no? Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. Great question. First time ever asked. Um, yes, sir. I, I, <laughs> Wow, good. This is really, you know, Ariel Hawani show yesterday. Yeah. I I went out and I know Jim because these are the kinds of shows I really wanted to do because it's not just about fight talk or this thing. That stuff needs to be addressed. I have had, I used to phone nine hundred numbers and just put the phone down, racking up the bill, not even listening because it was my way of sabotaging my parents. My they go, what the hell, nine hundred dollar phone bill? What the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm like, yeah, there is something wrong with me. Um, but. When I was a nightclub DJ, it, it was not good. And it was all, it was never enjoyable. It was just about um, trying to medicate. And yeah. there is that. It's, and so even now, I, I am single, but I, I feel I can't be in a marriage or a relationship or bring a child into the world because at my lowest points, I would not wish what I go through under any, uh, towards anyone. So, um it's weird, man. I, I it, that that's also something I think uh, that has to be investigated because everything's impulsive. I spend money. I spent uh, over fifteen hundred dollars buying people dinner over the last two three days. Just yeah. I'm always that guy. I, I I love to take care of everybody, regardless of the cost. So uh, thankfully, Frank Shamrock, who the legendary fighter course, who sure. has become my best friend and manager, he uh, takes care of my finances and helps me uh, with my life. And I wouldn't be where I am without people like him. So. I have people looking after me. 
Otherwise, it would be it would be big trouble. Yeah, and it's it's the, the nine hundred numbers. It's funny. I remember years ago the way to do it was you had to send in a money order. Cause I didn't have credit cards. <laughs> I sent in a money order to California, and I got sent back a, a list of phone numbers wow. you can call between these hours. And I wanted to jerk off at some crazy hour. And I remember the girl on the phone went, what? You want to talk like that at this hour? (laughs) She got so mad at me. (laughs) The one time time I called where I really wanted to talk to someone, she went, hello. Uh, And I said, hey, how's it going? Uh, This is, you know, Mark, I think was my nom de guerre. Mark. She goes, not tonight, honey. I got an earache. Oh, no. I'm like, you son of a bitch. What? Has well, te- has not texting tonight, you? I got a headache. Not tonight, I have an earache. Sorry. Has texting gotten you in the, in the phone? Because you got it right here all the time. Yeah. You can't put it down. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i I'm a phone addict for sure. People, Well, here, I'll tell you guys, and it was always made fun of. I, I was late to the Twitter party. I came in 2009, and guys, I have 222.1 thousand tweets that oh I've made. Oh, my gosh. Well, Think you're also that. like, you're a, you're I'm very a, interactive. And you're a retweeting professional. Well, well I, I'm the mayor of Retweet City, as you know, and, and it's part of my way of trolling other people on the, <laughs> hey, you guys wanted to create this wonderful thing? Well, here you go. I'll, I'll send you an avalanche of shit. But, uh, but look, 222,000 tweets. So, every, yeah, I'm very much a, a high, you, ad, highly addictive personality. Are you a numbers guy, too? Like, do you keep up with stuff like that? Like, oh, 220, okay, I got to go yeah, to 230, well, and I got to... What's this say on my bracelet? Uh, 11, 11, 11. And that's been uh, another, again, whether a sign, whether whatever it is, uh, you, you you know, there was a show that was on HBO that was canceled already here and now that actually had the 11, 11 phenomenon as one of its storylines. And I'm like, I'm, it, it's been something that's followed me around throughout my life. And I've always thought, well, it has to be something. I look, go online, you see everyone's conspiracy theories. For the most part, is it a, it's a positive thing, but I, I am... Yeah, quirky in that way, and 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 just you know the memory of names and stats and and what. That's why I uh, the condition has really helped my career, but the personal toll has been severe. What do so, you like? Sorry, Sam. What no, do you like ahead. when you argue? Do you get? I, 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 I tell louder. You get vicious, and I. I told you you're arguing with a movie Jim. screen. You forget that there's yeah. a real person. Attached. I get super loud, and I get. I go to the jugular. I have a like yourself. I got a very good vocabulary, but I at at my. At my angriest, the the vocabulary's gone, and it is it is very hurtful. And that's the other thing. Like I've you know threatened my family's life when I was very sick. I've obviously threatened my own. But I and it's I go from being the sweetest human being. I'll never forget when I was at a, a nightclub DJ. I was va- uh, dating the bartender, and I was so looking forward to seeing her beautiful girl. Hey, honey, it was this. I come in, I say, hey, honey, how's it going? I go into the DJ booth, put the records down. She comes up, starts massaging me. What the fuck are you doing? I'm like, like, and and the funny thing is, guys, this is what really strange to me. It's almost like I remove my, I get out of my body and I see what I'm doing and I can't stop it. It's like watching a film. It's like watching it from another room and then you realize you've hurt a real person. Yes. Yeah. And you're like, oh no. But so, but what I'm like, a lot of times they say, uh, you know, I've undergone uh, um, uh, blackout moments, I guess, where people have told me that, hey, this happened. And I'm like, wow, I don't remember that. But I remember even now, 20 years later, 25 years later, the, what I was doing. So why did I do it? Why, you know, you don't, and, and so I get why you want to keep it quiet, why you want to just stay in your little corner of the world. But when I was doing that, that's when I was looking at the ceiling saying, okay, so I've been there. I've been suicidal and I have lost too many people to suicide. And judging by the feedback, both online, uh, emails and Twitter, there are people suffering right now that need to, to see what I'm putting out there. It's the rush of the anger. That's what, it's that rush you get. It's like doing it's like doing a fucking popper. The rush of that anger. That's it that becomes more important than the person you're fucking hurting yep. is keeping that high going. Yes. Oh, I, I, it's chasing the dry like when I was starting my career at 16 out of high school. I was the, the right. promoter Al Tomko All-Star Wrestling was doing a charity show at my my high school and I from the womb was a pro wrestling fan and at 4 or 5 I visualized I visualized I'm going to work without knowing the term what it meant work for this company. I visualized being on American Network Television. I visualized calling the biggest fights in the world. I, I did visualize myself on stage telling jokes. Okay, I haven't done that yet, but it's like <laughs> I have, everything. but shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> no, believe me, you are uh, amazing, my friend, and and uh, I love just like I say, even this conversation means a lot to me because it's it's cool to have someone also sharing what you're doing, and maybe you do a lot, which I appreciate. But for me, even looking back then. 
they were like, holy crap, you're a natural on the stick, your energy, this and that. But when I look at the interview, because we have VHS tapes from my TV show, my, my life has been on camera, all of it. Right. And so I'm like, holy crap, man, I look like I'm on cocaine or something. But it's it's just me, the, 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 the rush. So the documentary is Bipolar Rock and Roller, and it's Friday at 9 p.m. on Showtime. So in it, you talk about uh, a period that I was obviously aware of when... Because there were a couple of spots, Showtime was one of them and WWE was another one, where you had to walk away, yep. and to your surprise, both organizations yep. called you and said, no, 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 we're going to find a spot for you, we're going to welcome you back in. So, because I'm so attached to the WWE sure. community, I was aware that when you kind of, uh, when you disappeared from WWE at first, people didn't know you had had a breakdown, people really, yep. a lot of people didn't even know about the bipolar sure. thing, and what ended up happening was there was uh, a lot of scandals on the internet and bullying mm -hmm. this and other people. Other people were getting blamed for that. Did you think that that was a fair thing, or were you kind of going like, "This isn't true"? What's yeah, being reported it, here? very tough time personally because it took me until the age of forty-six, and my best friend Michael Jansen, who died at nineteen, who really his death is what triggered my first meltdown that yeah. led to the diagnosis he he, uh, heart attack believe it or not and his family all his two his sisters and his mom and dad just arrived today they're here for the premiere i call them every year no matter where i am july 6th the anniversary of his death but to to get to your quote the reason i say that when we were 18 i'll never forget i picked him up at, at his college class and all he said was i can't wait until you work for vince mcmahon so that was when he was 18 i it took me until i was 46 to get to wwe Incredible feedback, amazing. You talk about euphoria, you talk about the mania, the the run, you know, working with Jerry Lawler right away. Every incredible run. I quickly realized, wait a minute, as as tough as this schedule is, and those, you know it, my man. What the sports entertainers, these athletes, uh, fifty two weeks a year, guys. It's amazing. It's unreal. And I'm just an announcer, so take that and add. Showtime Championship Boxing, Bellator MMA, other VO. Like, I had this whole other two careers going on. I thought, I'm Superman. I can maintain. No, I, I, the, the schedule, the, 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 just the stress of doing all of it was starting to take its toll. I, I and so, yes, you can, you know, I don't want to address anything else because all sure. of that is bullshit. And, and there were people that, of course, every working relationship you, you have to navigate. You're not always going to get along with, with everybody the way you would like to get along with, with your colleagues. But WWE, like you say, for all of its, you know, the, the giant corporation that it is and, 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 and anything you may have heard, Paul Levesque, Triple H, Michael Cole, uh, they called me and, and said, you know, we got to try. We know the, the quote from Paul Levesque was, Moral, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I think, pro, you know, this business is in your DNA. I said, absolutely right. How can we make this work? And it's funny because when they first approached me and they said, we want you to come and work with us, I said, is it for NXT? <laughs> I, was like, and that's, I, I love the underdog, the grind. The, so it, it worked out for the best. And I truly believe that this documentary, because I've heard from a lot of WWE folks, and yeah. honestly, whatever, it's hopefully going to help them as well because uh, all of us, we, we need to just release. And instead of, Jim, as we've discussed already, doing things harmful to ourselves or others, just, hey, what, what's the question you hear most every day? Hey, how are you? What's up? Do we really mean it? Do we actually listen to the answer? And do we think about the answer? Do you want to hear the answer? Exactly. Would you, would you listen to yourself if you're watching a tape of a fight or something and you hear your own voice? Yep. Are you like, wow, I did a good job? Or do you think no. like, I stink? Buddy, within minutes, I pick up the first mistake that I've made and it's fuck off. It's done. And I've, and, and whether it's, the, everyone's got our process. I hear a lot of performers, a lot of actors don't watch their work either. To me, it's it's releasing it, whatever it is, whether you like it or you don't, whether you like the pop culture references or the energy or you don't. To me, it's just, it's my therapy. It keeps me alive. So, no, I'm never satisfied. And honestly, even now, I got these headphones on listening. It's like people always say, man, do you always talk like that? Is that your voice? Yeah, it is. And I've always my well, you, you sound like an announcer. Well, I'm an announcer. I can talk <laughs> like this and maybe get some Disney work, I hope. Do a little voiceover work. No. Uh, and so I, I understand how everything is picked apart when we put ourselves out there. And mm -hmm. I truly understand how this is going to be scrutinized. But this is my magnum opus in terms of what I wanted to do for humanity and the fact that I've already hopefully saved or impacted in a positive way a few lives. That's fine. I'm willing to be a casualty for the cause. When you were going through, I mean, when you when you were working everywhere that you worked before you got to WWE yep. and you were you had your career, you already had your career, yeah. right? Yeah. 
was there before you're 46 this feeling of like I still want to get to WWE or was there more like no I found my niche I'm yeah. doing what I'm here to do it, it, by the time I guess I hit the 40s well I guess before I did New Japan Pro Wrestling on Access TV I yeah. probably still had well you know it'd be nice just to have that on my 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 resume but when I did New Japan and the, the feedback I got for that like I've always again I don't I don't want to be famous I don't want to be uh, what I, I wish I love what I do. But it's, I don't need all the, the, the other stuff. So for me, I love that underground feel of even New Japan at the time. We're the, the, you know, the cool kids in the corner, as it were. And I, I um, satiated my, my pro wrestling uh, commentary. So by the time I did that, I was fine. So WWE, and it's funny, Michael Cole followed me on Twitter. And mm-hmm. I'm like, is this the guy? Is this Michael Cole? So I went. <laughs> and, and the email came shortly thereafter, and, and the rest, you know, they say is, is, is history. But Do you I, know who's the first guy who had an eye or an ear for you? That or I mean, did somebody tell Michael Cole? Was yeah, Michael Cole just I, aware? I believe that, uh, well, Paul Levesque, Triple H had heard, he, you know, he walked Floyd Mayweather to, to yeah, one of, of his fights. So, and he's a boxing fan. Michael Cole was actually a boxing fan. So uh, I believe that I'd maybe been on their radar for a bit. And then when they made the move to, to USA Network Live, uh, I guess. They wanted to bring someone in with a, maybe a little bit of cachet. When I put together the sizzle reel, you'll appreciate this, Jim. I, I also was asked um, uh, Warren Buffett every year at his shareholders meeting, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, they do this entertainment video of him. Well, the year when I, how many years, a couple years now, he, he fought Floyd Mayweather at MGM Grand. They literally got in the ring. They filmed this thing with all these celebrities talking, and I'm the voice of the, the fight, and I'm ad libbing, you know, me making my whatever comments, riffing off this thing. And, um, and and Vince McMahon saw that and went, holy shit! If he can sell that, I mean, we'll, 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 get him. we'll get him. Do you have Did a moment? You, sorry, do you have a moment you look back on and go like, oh god, that was the fucking. Worst. Like, is there a moment yes. you look back on and broadcast that yes. is your worst? Yes. What? September two thousand seven, I believe. Hawaii. Gina Carano. Tanya Evinger. Um, Tanya Evinger had said on the uh, the press conference, "I'm here. I, w- I wish I could make out with Gina, but I'm here to knock her out. She's openly sure. gay. That's fine. You know. And at the time, it was great to see that kind of uh, conversation going. There was a lull in the fight, and uh, uh, I used the quote on the air, just say, "Hey, this provocative quote." And so I say, and Bill Goldberg, my broadcast partner, I'm not going to touch that with a 25 foot pole. And I instantly, again, trying to be creative, ad lib, go nuts, trying to make. I even the, even my original intention was still stupid and, and and gauche and should never have been done. But I said, oh, I wouldn't mind if they're going to kiss. I wouldn't mind touching with a 25 centimeter pole. Meaning, I'd like to be yeah. close to see them kiss. Yeah. Obviously, sure, it became where everyone thought well, I was referring to. The You're male dick. part of my yeah. anatomy, yeah. thank you, and and so and I I was I was destroyed, and I know how upset and rightfully so Gina and Tanya were. Uh, by the grace of God, they're both class acts, and Gina Carano is is just one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met, and we were able to put that b- behind us. I hope, but I I did lose a show. I was suspended, rightfully so. My Showtime could have lost my entire gig, but again, the. Uh, the understanding being what was my stupid original intention, and in a court of law, I probably would be found guilty anyway of trying to, to sell what I was originally trying to do, but even that was stupid. So that was the, the, the low point for me as a broadcaster. Did you see the, I'm sure you've seen it, the video that uh, WWE put out from the, the pinhole camera in the wow. announce table? You, yes, I have, and, and even that, it's funny, family so friends who've known me forever say, What's the big deal? <laughs> we know that like it's like everyone just figuring this out now, but it's yeah, it's so definitely WWE has a there's a pinhole camera in all the announcers tables. It's really just used for communication between the back sure. and the front, but they record everything. And so I guess they saw this and Takeover, saw what Morrow was doing at the table in New yeah. Orleans. And I mean when he's doing his commentary, He's up, he's standing, he's jumping, he's throwing his arms. Sure. Yeah, I mean, he is really yeah. emoting. And I guess they hadn't seen anything like this before, so they put out a montage of just Moro. You can't even see the action. You yeah, just, just see hear my call and see it. Moro's physical, everything. Manic, and, mania. And it went, it's gone Yeah, it's going everywhere. crazy. People, and, and, and it's funny how many people, hey, in fact, how many... Haters have said, "Wow, it is genuine. It is wow. I have a, so, I have a new respect for you, sir." And and I'm like, it's. I, I mean, I appreciate that, but again, there is that tinge of mania, right? And I believe it's okay. The same thing. Well, you can you you can you can yes. you can utilize it, right? You can you can tunnel it and, sure. and push it through this constructed yes. thing. It's just it. Once the show's over is when you have to then start to deal uh, with it. Right? Yes. The exactly. same thing that makes you so good at that yes. is the same thing that will make you go home and hear the Robin Williams hung himself Fuck. and go, I admire his courage. Buddy, 
That's amazing, man. When he died, I was fl- because I've I've been a, who isn't I've been a sure. walking, talking uh, a tribute to, to Robin Williams. Love the guy, and in fact, got to meet his son Cody. And even that, it's so it's the forced gump of broadcasting. I try to to call myself I, sometimes, I but fits. he but he when when he died, people right away all all of a sudden, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Because. It was weird that it took, like, again, a giant of the, the entertainment industry to take his life knowing what he was suffering through. So that's the other reason for the doc. Here I am. I'm not going to, I'm not dead, but I want, and, and I hope to God I, I die a peaceful, you know, death in my sleep sure. at 111 years old, Mr. Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> but, but see, his, look at what, he, uh, why did he have to die for, for everyone to say, how are you? Are you okay? Are you okay? Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, we don't need to lose anymore. We've lost enough. Let's, let's keep this conversation going like this. And yeah. the documentary, let's promote it properly. Bipolar rock and roller. You're such an open guy and you're so, uh, revealing. It's on Showtime this Friday, nine o'clock and it's Mauro Ranallo on Twitter. Yeah. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you did this. And I know that, uh, uh, in my wife's family, she uh, has a family member that uh, suffers from the same mm-hmm. thing, and I watched this with her. And at first, she goes, "I don't, I don't want to see this. It's yeah. too close to yeah, home." For sure. I bet she watched the whole thing, and she like it. It, it, it finally, even though there is a human sure. face to it for her and for I, and and it's it's to see the highs, the lows, mm-hmm. to see you in these private moments mm-hmm. is like okay, we're starting to wrap around, yeah. and this idea that like. Where some people go, like, well, it's a it's a cry for attention. It's yes. this, it's that. Morrow's story is so great because you've got a guy that is so singularly focused yeah. on this goal, yeah. and bipolar is so destructive <laughs> yeah. to that goal yeah. that he wouldn't be. Yeah. This isn't. It doesn't make sense that no, this would doesn't. be a cry for attention because it's, all Morrow wants to do is what he's doing, yeah. and all he's got is this yeah. thing in his oh, brain. And don't, and don't get me wrong. That again, Andy Kaufman, another yes. idol of mine, and even when watching it, to be honest, I'm like. I, I can, it's because I'm so warped. I think yeah, I can see where people go, wow, this is a pretty interesting piece of performance art. But why I'm sabotaging my own thought process. You guys mean I, I go, yeah. yeah, I can see where people see people I'm a piece think of this shit. Whole thing exactly. Work. Yeah. It's a work. It's, <laughs> it's a, a work. work. It, but it makes it harder. <laughs> the, the attention you'd get from it does not outweigh the negative of what it does. Sure. Absolutely not. And that's why. Uh, as much as it even uh, hurts me to the core to say, you know, I love kids. I love people, obviously. I, I want to help people. But I, I I, just can't imagine having a loved one like my child go with, with, through what I go through because I know what is done to my parents, even my brothers, and all of my friends. Like the ripple effect, the, the toll it takes on those who really care is, oh, man, it's gut-wrenching. Well, everybody's got to watch yes. this movie. Bipolar Rock and Roller, Friday, 9 p.m. Morrow. So glad you came Oh, by. man, Thank this you, has man. been a thrill, guys. And uh, Sam, always a pleasure working with you, of course. And Jim, honestly, man, uh, big fan of all your work. And thank you Thank for you. being so kind. It's and, nice uh, to meet you and, as well. And caring. I, I really appreciate, appreciate it. it, Jim.